So, uh, good to be back with you. Uh, this is uh, part two of the Atonement series. Uh, but I want to talk about Sherry's picture here. Uh, in Virginia City in Nevada, uh, Wild West country for sure, these are the wild horses that live in the mountains of the Sierras there and in the valleys, uh, all the way up that valley to the north and to the south uh, is wild horse country. And these are two moms and their colts and uh, it's quite an adventure because those, those animals are acting like nothing's going on, but if you look carefully, they're paying uh, very careful attention to Sherry because she's standing there clicking away with the camera and they're going, okay, we're posing for you, but you uh, just know we're watching. Okay, wild horses, thank you, Sherry. Awesome picture. Uh, and by the way, we didn't try to ride them, just saying. Uh, not that safe, but uh, those are very protective moms. All right, so the final attack on God can only be made through attacking his church, and that means that the doctrines of the church come under attack. And I'm addressing in this series, this is the third part of five, and this is part two of the atonement. The atonement is absolutely critical to the gospel. So when we look at this attack on the church, the alteration of the atonement can potentially do away with Christianity in its entirety. So, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I want to address the definition, but first I want just a general overview of atonement. It means to have all of your issues resolved that separated you from God. That means that the atonement makes you at one with God again. It means to be restored to oneness with God. Oneness means there's nothing between you and God that you are on a very clear, close relationship. Therefore, any view of the atonement must bring you into a fully stored relationship without anything standing between you and God. Now, what I mean by that is that your view of the atonement cannot add any additional works or human merit to make it successful, or we risk becoming our own redeemer by our good works. In other words, the theology that you are saved by the, your contribution and God adds to that is a heretical definition of the atonement. It's either God has fully atoned for your failure and your sin and fully restored you to God by his action alone, or he's not a redeemer. He hasn't fully atoned. He hasn't brought you into one with God. Kafar the Hebrew word on the next slide, a primitive root to cover. Now, when we dealt with this in our last presentation, we talked about the covering God made for Adam and Eve. That's kafar. That's atonement illustration. He made a covering of skins, a tunic, uh, coats or clothing, if you would, to cover the shame of the nakedness of Adam and Eve after they sinned. The word is translated to make an atonement. The kafar is to cleanse, to be forgiven, to be merciful, to pardon, to purge, away, sin you could say, to put off, to reconcile, or to make reconciliation. Now keep some of those key words in your mind as we go through this conversation. And I just tried to keep the simplest words out of this translation so that you can go back and spend more time on it. Let's go to Psalms. Psalms 49, verse 7 and 8. No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever. You cannot atone for your own family members. Only God can do that. Psalm 65, 3. Iniquities prevail against me. That's sin. As for our transgressions, you will provide an atonement for them. So listen to the psalmist. Their hope is in the atonement that God is going to provide. This is a lesson learned in the Old Testament sanctuary. Psalm 79, 9. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake, restore us, Father, that your name may be glorified is another way you might want to say that. Proverbs 16.6, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. Take a deep breath there. Isn't that beautiful? 
and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. Now, that does not mean to be afraid. That is by being in awe of the holiness of God. We move away from evil towards God. Because God has atoned for our iniquity, our sin, and we move towards him away from evil. We depart from it. Hosea 13, 14. Shall I rede- ransom them from the power of the grave, Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your thorns? O grave, where is your sting? The word ransom and redeemed is atonement language. So I'm going to move into the New Testament now. What I want you to understand is I'm using those words like redeem and reconcile and restore in the sense of atonement. Now, in Galatians, listen to what Paul is saying. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's the law that points out our sin. That is the law that we try to save ourselves by meeting its requirements in our own strength. Okay, and I'll clarify that as we go along. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So it is through faith we enter into the benefits of the redemption, the reconciliation, the atonement of Christ. It is through faith. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. I want to pause here that he is born of a woman. He is born in flesh as a man, as your Goel, your kinsman redeemer, born under the condemnation of the law, that means death, so that he might redeem or reconcile those who are under the law. That's under its condemnation, under its death penalty, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So atonement is restoration into the family, reconciliation, where you become a son and daughter of God. Because you are sons and daughter, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Daddy, or Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter. And if a son or a daughter, then you are an heir through God to inherit God's blessings. By faith. And by faith alone. As there is no other way to experience the joy of the atonement. Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. In other words, the atoning blood of the Lamb, Christ took our sin as we have looked at the Old Testament model of placing your sins on the Lamb and then having to take the life of the Lamb, Christ took our sins into the most holy place in heaven. For what reason? To make final atonement for your sin. Having eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 14 and 15. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 15, for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. So again, it is what Christ accomplished at the cross that gives us access to our eternal inheritance. I'm making this simple, I know. It can certainly be deeper, but I am trying to do these presentations in about 15 minutes just to give you things to go search on your own. Notice Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you there for brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a sacrifice. Now, I have 
translated this text slightly, and if you go look it up, you'll see I made a change. That you present your bodies a sacrifice, living, holy, and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, a sacrifice is a thing that says, okay, I'm dying to self. And in the original Greek, some translators say a living sacrifice, which is incongruent. So I've taken the concept of a sacrifice, saying that you have died to self. Now you rise up in the newness of Christ, living in Christ, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. How could this be? Because of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. That is a lot to chew on. I've just given this to you just to ponder, to process, to pray about, and to think about. And I want to close with Sherry's picture. Here's another one of those wild horses right here in the Sierra Mountains. And this mare is just standing there. Uh, I mean, these wild horses have the spectacular long manes and colors that are so unique and so beautiful. And here she is out there in that sagebrush, and she is posing, saying, I am here. Just go ahead and take my picture. Thank you, Sherry, for what you do. Thank you for the blessing. And I have to tell you, there's nothing more spectacular than out there in that open country to see those wild horses just running and living and having the joy of freedom. I hope you find that freedom in Christ as well. After all, he has made full atonement for your sins and mine. He has reconciled you to the Father. You are now sons and daughters of God. Jesus is your kinsman redeemer. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the righteousness, the covering of you, which is the atonement work of God. I hope you find joy in the conversation. Blessings.